It's honestly an honor to be here. Um, many thanks to the faculty for including me. Welcome to all of the parents and the friends who were able to come. And more than anything, congratulations to the class of 2023. I was sitting essentially where you are right now about eight years ago. I was receiving the same degree, and in the time since then, I devoted myself to trying to share math with others, mainly through YouTube, but also through some other avenues. And what I want to talk to you about today is a small way that my relationship with math has changed during that time, um, and a way that I hope that it continues to change. The change is personal, but it's something that might just apply to you too, and if so, it might actually help in shaping your future. I was reflecting before today on what it was that pulled me into the subject in the first place. Why is it that I fell in love with the subject? Why is it that I chose to major in it when I was here? Why is it that I've spent the last eight years in this sort of weird, unorthodox career path of explaining it online? And you see, there's a story that I think a lot of us tell, and the story is centered on things like the inescapable beauty of the subject, or the fact that it's very charming, just how well applied it is to not just physics and not just computer science, but a plethora of different technical fields. But that story, at least for me, would gloss over another factor that might be just as influential, but which is a lot more awkward to talk about. Ego. I don't know if you remember what it was like to be a child, um, if you remember what it was like maybe in elementary school and the way it came across to us. If I look back to my earliest memories of math, I think I was very lucky because it felt to me like a game, and I think this had to do with how my dad would present it to me. But in the context of school, it had a very different character. Uh, it felt competitive. I don't think this was the intention of the teachers, I don't think it was the intention of any of the adults around, but there was a certain unspoken assumption that the subject was supposed to be hard, that many of us were going to struggle with it. And no doubt, thanks to the games that I would play with my dad, I was one of the fortunate ones who found it a little bit easier. And because I found it a little bit easier, I think I came to like the subject not because it was beautiful and not because it was useful and not even because it was playful, but frankly, because of that childish self-satisfaction that comes from feeling like you're doing well at something that the adults tell you you're supposed to be doing well at. And for a long time in school, this sort of kicked off a positive feedback loop. I spent a lot of time with the subject because I liked it. I liked it because I felt good at it. And to the extent that I actually was any good at it, it was because I was spending so much time with it. And I don't want to suggest that this is true for everyone who likes math. And I also don't want to suggest that this is the the kind of loop that doesn't have struggles involved with it, because there absolutely are struggles any way that you learn math. It's more that, if I'm honest, the forces that kept me pushing through some of the struggles and putting in the time and the practice and the effort that's necessary to get better at the subject were at least in part motivated by a desire to be seen as being good at it. And, you know, I was a teenager. It's, it's hard to escape a little bit of ego. But ego is an awkward motive to talk about. And if I'm fair, the beauty in the application really did play some role. It's not like they, they weren't there at all, but they came in a lot later. Um, because of this positive feedback loop, I was spending time in the subject. I would chat with my teachers after school about it. I would go to local math circles events. I learned what a mathematician was. I would read books about problem solving. And in that kind of immersion, it's hard not to fall in love with the actual beauty of the subject. So even if the passion began for these slightly more self-centered and slightly more childish reasons, that started to give way to something a little bit purer, something more like an aesthetic sense, uh, something a little more outward focused. It's a little like a fossil where, you know, the organic molecules slowly start to give way for a longer term, sturdier mineral that'll be there, be there to the end. Uh, for me, it became a little bit less about perceived success and a little bit more about the subject itself. But that's not actually the change that I want to talk to you about. Uh, this shift in motivation, the fossilization process, probably happened maybe towards the end of high school, start of my time here at Stanford. But what I want to talk about is how analogous to the way that the new minerals of a fossil still take on the same general shape as the original bone, I think there might have been some lingering after effects associated with the less pure original motivations for the subject. See, while I was here at Stanford, I remember a lot of my peers would use the word interesting. Now, why is it that you chose to go to that internship that you did this summer? Or why did you choose to work with this professor that you did? Oh, it seemed like they were working on very interesting problems. But what does the word interesting mean? Interesting to whom? I think, if I was to look back on myself and how I was using the word, at least part of what I meant by it was that a problem seemed hard. It seemed recognizably hard, but not so hard that I couldn't sink my teeth into it a little bit. Utility had a strange backseat for me, and it really was about the challenge in and of itself. And I don't think this was just me. If we fast forward, by the time I was making YouTube videos, 
For a long time, one of the most popular videos on the channel was one that had the title, The Hardest Problem on the Hardest Test, which admittedly is blatant clickbait. Uh, and it was about a problem from the Putnam, and between you and me, it wasn't really the hardest problem that the Putnam's ever shown, but it was positioned as number six. But if we think about the fact that it was clickbait, why would that work? Why is it that something on the order of 10 million people outside the usual subscriber base were curious to click on a topic, not because it was beautiful or not because it promised anything useful, but merely because it promised that something was challenging? Now, to be fair, sometimes difficulty does correspond with something that's useful. Maybe there's a field that's blocked by a puzzle that nobody knows how to solve. And if someone could solve it, it would unlock more utility in that field. But the question is whether the reason for caring about the problem fundamentally was about that utility, or if it was about the fact that it's widely recognized to be challenging, and because of what that might imply for the person who does solve it and how they might be perceived. Now, I'll give you another example for where you know, origins of a slightly more youthful and competitive spirited motivation for math might have had these lingering after effects, even after that motivation was no longer the dominant one. When I started making videos about math, um, I was actually a senior here at Stanford when I very first began. I was uploading them to a channel that I had given the very strange name of Three Blue One Brown. And at that time, I cared a lot about the content seeming very different from traditional lessons out there. I cared a lot that it was showing something students wouldn't see in the usual linear track of school. And I think I cared a lot about being perceived as providing something that was original, something that was distinct. Now, if we contrast this, after I graduated, I spent time working at Khan Academy. And there, the goal was very explicitly to make content that met students where they are then. I made a couple hundred pieces of content, mostly centered around multivariable calculus. And I was choosing topics not based on originality or a desire to stand out. More than anything, I was choosing topics simply because they were on the list of what students had asked to know about, what they needed to know. And the feedback in both categories of these videos was positive, but with a different character, and one of them was a lot deeper. Those on early Three Blue and Brown felt like people watching a shared sport, something that we all enjoyed watching together. But those on Khan Academy had a very different flavor. They were characterized more than anything by gratitude. I felt that I had actually helped people, and they found them genuinely useful. So later on, on Three Blue and Brown, I started to prioritize lessons that met learners where they were. I did a series about linear algebra, I did a series about calculus. People asked if I could explain what is a Fourier transform or how do neural networks work, and so I obliged. Now the topics weren't original. You know, there's lots and lots of other videos and pieces of content online that explained those. But these are by far the ones that have received the most gratitude in that time and which have accounted for any success that I've found since then. There's always room for novelty in the specific approach after a topic is chosen. But the thing that took me an embarrassingly long time to really learn. The lesson that took a long time to genuinely sink in is that when topics are chosen primarily because of how they'll help people, and concerns like novelty and originality and whether something is capital I interesting are all relevant only insofar as they help the goal of meeting a learner where they are, that's when the reach feels genuinely meaningful. And for what it's worth, I do think that shift in focus is probably what made the difference between videos being a hobby and videos being a career. Now, for every one of you who's sitting here right now, whatever it is that you choose to do moving forward with the math that you've learned here and the other skills that you've learned here, the future fulfillment that you derive from that work is going to have as much to do with how you evaluate what's worth working on as it does with the strengths that you're bringing to the table. The future mark that your work leaves on the world has as much to do with how you're evaluating what you're working on as it does anything else. And my advice to you right now, and you're at this very pivotal juncture in your life, is to be especially mindful of where that evaluation function comes from. If after today you're going into industry, you might ask yourself, how are you choosing where to work? How did you choose who to work with? How are you choosing what to build? If you are going into academia, ask yourself if it's for the right reasons and how you'll choose which problems to work on. How much of it depends on the way that you'll be perceived for solving the problems and how much depends on the value that other people will find from it. Now, if you're going into teaching, or honestly, if you're going into teaching, you're probably wiser than the rest of us, so I, I don't have much to say. See, in the last eight years, I felt a shift in my own evaluation function. Hardness in and of itself, that doesn't cut it. Originality for its own sake is hollow. And math still has an intrinsic beauty, but honestly, these days, that beauty is all the more potent if there's at least a whisper of something genuinely useful in sight. 
I can't tell you what the right evaluation function is for you. I can suggest that it probably will matter more when it depends less on yourself and it depends a little bit more on others and what you're doing for them. But what I am sure of is that time spent right now, today, seriously reassessing where the evaluation function comes from stands to make your future richer. So congratulations once again. All of us here are anxiously awaiting what that future looks like for each and every one of you.